New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. We all know the name Doc Holliday, but who was John Henry Holliday in that lifetime beyond the fences of the OK Corral? where he stood guns drawn with Wyatt Earp. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. I have to tell you that invoking that image of the Old West was really exciting. In fact, I'm so excited about today's interview to go back in the past and bring somebody to you, as I love to do here on the History Author Show, that we all think we know we've been influenced by movies and tv on doc holiday but we don't know the real man as he was when he walked breathed and shot among us our guide is victoria wilcox and the book she brings us is called the world of doc holiday history and historic images victoria is founding director of georgia's holiday dorsey fife museum and she's the brains behind the documentary. See what I did there? Documentary, get it? About Doc Holliday? It's called In Search of Doc Holliday. She also authored the Saga of Doc Holliday trilogy, featuring the historical fiction novels Southern Sun, Dance with the Devil, and Dead Man's Hand. You can see Southern Sun right behind me if you are watching via that YouTube channel. I get a lot of books, and I told Victoria that hers earned a place on my shelf, even though we didn't get a chance to do an interview about that novel. True West Magazine named Victoria the best historical Western novelist, and her debut novel earned Georgia's Author of the Year Award. You can visit her at victoriawilcoxbooks.com or on the social media outlets Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where you can find me as well. Okay, now that we've strapped on those six-shooters and arrived back in the dusty days when the West was won, let's join Victoria Wilcox and explore the world of Doc Holliday. And here we are with Victoria <laughs> Wilcox. She's going to share with us her wonderful book. It's called The World of Doc Holliday, History and Historic Images. Thanks for moseying on to the History Author Show, Victoria. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Well, it's very exciting for me. I had to re-record my intro a few times, and I also have to discipline myself. So I, I got that oldie, timey, old west Jimmy Stewart type <laughs> <laughs> reference to mosing down the trail out of the that way. That was early. very good. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Don't encourage me. But it, <laughs> but it just shows how much the myth and the legend and those old radio shows and the movies get into our minds. And that's something certainly here in Doc Holliday. We forget that this Old West figure was a real man. He had a real world. And for you, on your path to meeting him, you say a funny thing happened on the way to dental school, which is <laughs> just a, another great thing to be able to say. That's a good and one. That <laughs> that brought you, as your title says, to the world of Doc Holliday. So bring us on that journey with you. Take us to that first step. How do you meet Doc Holliday and how does it become such a big part of your life? Okay. Well, I actually met him through his cousin, Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind. My husband, as you said, went to dental school in Atlanta. We were from California. And uh, so we went to Atlanta. And of course, I looked for the thing that all readers look for in Atlanta, which is Gone with the Wind. And by the time we arrived, unfortunately, it was, you know, gone with the wind. <laughs> there wasn't much left of it. Um, but I uh, was fascinated by it. So every place I went, I looked for those old homes and just some trace of this other era in our country. So my husband graduated from dental school and we moved um, about an hour south of Atlanta to Fayette County. And uh, my first time driving through the little town of Fayetteville, I saw this beautiful, old looking, white columned house that looked just like something out of Gone with the Wind. And I saw it and I knew I had something to do with it. And I've never had that experience with a house before. Hardly had that with a person before. I knew I had something to do with it and I didn't know what it would be. And, uh, but every time I would drive by that house with my little girls, I'd say, someday mama's gonna do something with that. And I had no idea. And about 10 years went by 
And finally, finally, I called the local historical society to ask about this old house, you know, and they said, oh yeah, it's authentically old, all right. It was um, built before the Civil War. Civil War soldiers used to march right by this house. Oh, and it was owned by the uncle of Doc Holliday. And I said, excuse me, Doc Holliday, like the guy from the OK Corral. <laughs> and they said, yeah, and he used to visit here at this house when he was a, a child because this was his uncle's home and all the family gathered here. And I said, so Doc Holliday from the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona was here in Georgia in Fayette County at this house, this white columned house. And I was just amazed. And then on top of that, I found out that the house was also related, related to Margaret Mitchell. She had actually mentioned this place in the book Gone with the Wind. And she was related to Doc Holliday. Her second cousin was his childhood sweetheart. And that second cousin became um, a character in the book Gone with the Wind, actually the character of Melanie in Gone with the Wind. And then I found out that the community was talking about tearing down the house to make a parking lot. And I was just stunned. I said, you know, this, this important place of history, it's got, it's got movie connections and history connections and literary connections. And so I started a community action group to save it and turn it into a museum, which it is now. Now it's uh, the Holiday Dorsey Fife House Museum and it's um, on the National Register of Historic Places. And along the way, of course, as you're doing when you're developing a, a museum site, um, you're learning a whole lot about the families who live there. And I kept learning things about Doc Holiday that I'd never heard before. And I was a writer to start with and had always wanted to write a novel, didn't know what I was gonna write about someday. And I thought, well, this is it. I need to tell the story of Doc Holliday and Gone with the Wind, this love story with his cousin and then be able to share the family stories of Doc Holliday. And so I thought it would take me, you know, a couple of years to write that, wouldn't be bad. I could use the family history that I'd learned here and the things I knew in Georgia and um, would add to that the Doc Holliday information that was in all these other books that had already been written about him and you know, other movies and all these biographies. And as I got to that Western part of the story, I discovered that um, it didn't make sense. His Western history didn't make sense. He couldn't be in all the same places at the same time. He couldn't have done the different things they said he did at the same time. And I realized that most of the history of Doc Holliday, the Western history was just wrong. It was all lies or somebody's make-believe. And if I were going to write his story, which now I was very invested in, I wanted to tell the story of this real person and his real connections to literature and film and all, um, that I was going to have to go find his history. And so what I thought was going to be two years of writing ended up being 18 years. <laughs> and what I thought was going to be one long book ended up three, a trilogy. So that's how I met him. <laughs> and I spent many years invested in his life. And uh, along the way became a nationally um, recognized Doc Holiday expert, which was nothing I came to Georgia to do. So me and Doc, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey. And imagine if you'd taken another route that day, you never would have known that that was what was supposed to happen for you. <laughs> do you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, when, when something speaks to you, follow it, because that's probably something you need to do. And I think that if I hadn't have been so interested in Gone with the Wind, I would not have found out or been intrigued by that house the way I was. And it would be a parking lot now. And, you know, we'd have lost history. And I'm, I think it's fascinating how stories help us save our history. Well, that's the great thing about your books. And I have right here, your, I have your bookmark. They, <laughs> you sent me when you sent me a copy of Southern Sun. So here we go. These are the three books. You take it in fiction, but then you make this journey into telling us about the real world of Doc Holliday here right. in the world of Doc Holliday. <laughs> and because you have that background, you you say casually, oh yeah, I saved a historic home by the way. And it, <laughs> it sounds so, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm the founding director of the Holiday Dorsey Fife Museum. And I don't want to gloss over it because for readers, we don't need to see you there every day curating things or saving that house, but how does that role help you offer uh, a better book here to offer the world of Doc Holliday as a book and make it possible to tell a story that somebody who did just base it on watching a few movies could never offer? Okay, for starters, I was here in Georgia and that makes a huge difference. When I write historical fiction, I always travel to the places where the fiction happened. A lot of writers don't do that. A lot of writers, uh, will pick up a children's book about an area or a, or a story and they'll use that as their backdrop. 
And I, I feel like every time I've gone someplace, the story has changed for me entirely. And so being in Georgia for starters, let me see things that were correct about his life and things that weren't correct about his life and that didn't, you know, things that didn't make sense. So there's that beyond sense of place, actually um, seeing the thing as it was, for instance, when I was writing, I believed as all the books had said that he left Georgia because he was dying of consumption. And everybody knows that he died of tuberculosis and that's why he left Georgia. So as I'm, I'm already writing and I went to Dallas, Texas, which is where he went. So I went to Dallas to, um, find out about his time there. And supposedly all the books said that he went west to the high dry plains of the Western frontier to dry out his consumption. So I believe it. And I'd never been to Dallas. So I got off the plane in Dallas and they had a, they didn't have a jetway that day. They just had little stairs down to the tarmac. So they opened that plane door and whoosh, in came all of this hot, humid air. And I went, wait, what happened to the high dry plains? Well, when I tell this story to people in Dallas, Texas, when I've spoken there, they just think it's hilarious because Dallas isn't high and it's not dry. And um, it's more troubled by floods on the Trinity River than dry air. Um, and as it turned out, as I was studying his life, going back to the old newspapers and things at the time there in Dallas, it turned out um, Dallas at the time had just been closed down by a yellow fever epidemic when he got there. It was, it was known as the second least healthy place in the country to live right behind the bayous of Louisiana. <laughs> It was impossible. He couldn't have gone there for his health. So then I had to backtrack and find out why did he go west, which turned out to be something entirely different. But I, and so many writers had written that same lie that he went west for his health because they never bothered to get on a plane and go to Dallas, Texas. So you've got to be there to understand the history. Another funny one, I was in Las Vegas, New Mexico, where he that figures into his story. And I knew that he had owned a piece of property there because people had referenced it. And I wrote three times, well, I wasn't there yet, but I wrote three times to the county clerk asking for some information about, about his property there. And three times they wrote back and said, we don't have anything on John Henry Holiday. We don't have anything, sorry. And I said, Doc Holiday, anything? And I knew he did. So I finally got on a plane and flew to New Mexico and went into the county clerk's office, opened up this huge clerk, you know, book from the 1880s, flipped it open and there was his name. D-O-C-K, it was spelled differently. So they just hadn't seen it. So, you know, as any genealogist will tell you, you've got to go to the place, you've got to look at the original doc, the original document. So because I was working with this house museum, I was interested in the true history and I was digging through primary sources rather than reading other people's novels. In fact, I wouldn't read a novel about his life while I was writing about him because I didn't want somebody else's story in my head. So. The difference in being a, um, running a, a museum site is that you're trying to tell true history and that you're spending every day trying to find that real history. And so as I was writing novels and I wrote, I wrote historical fiction because I feel like most people get their history from stories and I wanted to tell a story about his life. But I would get an idea of where this plot was going and then I'd stumble over some new historical fact and I'd have to back up rework the story, rethink the plot. I never changed the history for the sake of the story. I would change the story for the sake of the history because as you said, I did want people to know the real Doc Holliday. So I think it, it's a huge difference being a historian writing a novel. <laughs> I like that in this book as well, you, I picture anyway, you as a novelist and you as somebody involved with the museum, not just involved, heck, it's, it's your museum. So you <laughs> are able to share all of these things with your readers here. You're able to give them things that I'm sure in print, you would have loved to have been able to go to every reader and be able to show them a picture that you found, but you can't do that in the medium of historical fiction. So exactly. right, there's a, there's a lot in here that you will be able to see. So I wanted to ask about that here. Doc Holliday is born in 1851 in Georgia. And the world is very different then. It's the dawn of photography. We barely have any, any pictures at all in general, much less of some kid here in Georgia, right? And then he only lives 36 years. He dies in 1887. You use train travel. It works really well for your book as, <laughs> as an organizing way to help us follow him, following his footsteps. 
but you're going to be looking at a lot of sameness there. You're going to be looking at a lot of the, just the same area, one horse towns that maybe haven't changed much. So I wanted to ask that how much of Doc Holliday's world is left for us to see today and how much of it do we see here in the world of Doc Holliday, your book? Well, and let me let me clarify for your viewers that there's a difference between those novels I wrote and this other book that we're talking about now, The World of Doc Holliday. And I'll answer your question by telling you how I came to write The World of Doc Holliday. So I was on a book tour for the novels in Colorado, and I was speaking in Silverton, Colorado, way up in the mountains where he had gambled and there were, you know, newspaper reports about him there. And the most interesting way to get there is on the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad, which is a huge excursion journey. So I took it up there and beautiful vi you know, vistas of the San Juan mountains and the river down below, and it's just gorgeous. And along the way, I thought, you know what? He took the same exact route. The train hasn't changed. In fact, some of these cars are still antique cars. And this is exactly what he would have seen. It's nature there, it, it's unchanged. And these spectacular views that I was looking at were exactly what he would have seen. And I thought, even though I wrote novels, Nobody yet had followed him around to, like you said, to look at what he was seeing. And by the time I got back to Georgia, this whole book was in my head that I would follow him around on the trains and let people actually see and give images. So what's left of his world? Several of the antique train routes, the Durango and Silverton, everybody who loves the West and loves trains needs to take that train ride. It's just iconic on a steam engine up through the mountains. Um, and so that view he would have seen. The Royal Gorge, uh, railroad that goes through Southern Colorado, that Royal Gorge, it's mountains. It hasn't changed. It looked the same as it did to him then. And so there's that ride you can take. Um, from Leadville, Colorado, where he, he was in the last years of his life, there's an excursion train that goes out from Leadville and up to Aspen, Colorado. And it looks exactly as it would have been. In fact, there's a place in the novels where I talk about him taking that train ride and I described what he was seeing, and he was in the book, he was writing a letter back to his cousin, Maddie, and telling her what he was seeing on the train. And the way I got that is, I was on that train, writing down what I was seeing. And I just turned it into a letter from him to his cousin, Maddie. So all of those, a lot of places in Colorado, you still see what he saw. His world is still there. The cities, not so much. Philadelphia, he went to dental school in Philadelphia. It's changed markedly, of course. But the open countryside still looks like his world. If you travel across the desert in Arizona, from Northern Arizona around Prescott, if you drive down to Phoenix and then down to Tucson, that's pretty much where the, the stagecoach routes went. So what you're seeing off in the distance, that is still the world of Doc Holliday. And of course, when you get to everybody's favorite famous Western town, Tombstone, Tombstone has tried to make sure it looks like Tombstone used to look. They had paved streets, they pulled them up, and now it's mm -hmm. dirt again. So uh, a lot of the buildings are still there. There's actually a lot in our world that was his. So for Doc Holiday fans, you know, read the book, follow along with Doc and see what the world looked like to him. You say Doc Holiday fans, and there are certainly plenty of those out there. I've heard you speak to them and say, they'll come up to you, they'll have the most obscure things, but also <laughs> they own this picture of Doc Holiday. He's oh, theirs. Do. And so when they come to you and they don't necessarily want you to harsh their mellow, right? They don't want to know the real history. They they don't necessarily want to change their image of him. They think things like Val Kilmer, his portrayal in Tombstone, that's the only one that they want, the only one they'll accept. They, yep. they insist that he continue acting and that he somehow do it, you told me, from age eight. Somehow he's supposed to squish himself down. I mean, it, the greatest actor out there can't act quite eight. That's a little bit weird. And you've joined him, you've joined Val Kilmer mm -hmm. at those Doc Holidays in Tombstone where all these things you're talking about there are really important to people, to giving them that sense but there is that little bit of disconnect for people that are enjoying a fictional version of somebody and you as a scholar. So I like that part of it. I want to get to that in just a minute. Yeah. But first, since you invoke Tombstone and the world of Doc Holliday, and I thought of Val Kilmer to bring him up right there. Let's start with his portrayal, because that's who okay. most people are picturing right now. Yep. How did you find his performance, his accent and the screenplay that he executed in that movie? Wow, that is a multiple part question there. <laughs> okay, number one, let's start with the screenplay. The screenplay was written by Kevin Jarre, who was Academy Award nominated for writing the screenplay for Glory. Wonderful screenwriter. And he became fascinated by the history of Tombstone and used a lot of different sources that were out there to write this 
fabulous script, much longer than the movie is. The movie, the script was edited way down before they finally made the movie. So I, I'm i looking forward to someday seeing, you know, if there's any such thing as a director's cut, I wanna see everything that they put in there. Um, for me, watching the movie was really fun because I knew the sources that Jar had used to write his story. So I knew, oh, this comes from this book and this comes from this book. And I knew which parts of novels he was using, et cetera. So to me, the, the script is a wonderful piece of literature. And as a work of literature, he took literary license with the history and um, altered some things for the sake of the film. And when you mention that to Doc Holliday fans, it's hard for them to swallow like, for instance, I hate to even go there. I, I've learned when I speak around the country, I, I started out when I would speak everywhere about the real Doc Holiday history. And I finally realized I have to just give them little bits of it because they really don't want the truth. Um, everybody's favorite Doc Holiday scene in that, in that movie, in that screenplay is when he kills Johnny Ringo. It's so good. You know, he gets to kill the bad guy and he does it in such a clever way and it never happened. Holiday was in Colorado. Johnny Ringo shot himself. He was in Arizona but um, it's done for a literary purpose and it makes the film so good. So there's number one problem. Um, so the screenplay is fantastic. And the way the screenplay was edited for the film, um, uh, Kurt Russell had something to do with the final editing of it. And he threw out a lot of Wyatt Earp lines and kept in a lot of Doc Holliday lines. So there's more, there, it's more Doc heavy in that film than it was originally even intended to be. And, um, if you listen to the film, you feel like you're getting a, a whole a whole life of Doc Holliday. But if you watch it carefully, what you're getting is a series of great one-liners. Doc rarely even says a whole sentence in that film. There are all these great little quips. So we just love it because he's so clever. And you know, the real Doc would have had much more to say than that. He was a very wordy guy. Um, so problems with the film in that um, when I talk to fans. Okay, um, let's see. Kurt Russell's performance was brilliant. He should have been nominated for an Oscar, at least. He should have won. Tommy Lee Jones won that year for The Fugitive. Great performance. Bill Kilmer didn't even get nominated and he should have. And his fans around the world think he totally got robbed and probably should have won. Um, he, but it's important to know that he wasn't playing Doc Holliday. People think he was channeling Doc and he wasn't. He was brilliantly acting a script which was written based on some history and novels with creative literary license. So that's not Doc Holliday, that's a character created by Kevin Jarre and beautifully enacted by Val Kilmer. And I think it's sad when we steal Jarre out of this and just think Val Kilmer somehow channeled Doc Holliday. Well, that drops out the writer entirely, so that bothers me. So Kevin Jarre created that character. Val Kilmer didn't channel him, he acted him. And I think that's a nod to his acting expertise. So we don't want to steal that from Val either. He wasn't just channeling some spirit of Doc. He was acting. So between the two things, I just kind of dislike when people say he channeled Doc. No, he didn't. He brilliantly acted a wonderful script. Okay, and then you asked me about the accent. That's always the dicey part. I am sure that Val had a very good vocal coach for that. And they were trying to find an accent that seemed, you know, Old South. But what it comes across to people in Georgia as is Old South in Louisiana. It really sounds far more, in fact, my children, when they were old enough finally to see the film, they said, is he French? Um, and that's not Val Kilmer, that's, yeah. that's his vocal coach said, hey, talk like this and it'll sound like an Old South accent, except it doesn't, it sounds like an old Louisiana accent. And accents are quite different around the country. I mean, if you go to North Georgia and you cross over the border to Tennessee, it's a different accent. And uh, Doc actually has living relatives who still live down in South Georgia and Valdosta. They don't sound anything like Val Kilmer. Um, so that's my, my one gripe, but I don't think that was Val. I think that was his vocal coach. Another important reason to go to the place, as you were saying, and see oh, the yeah. people, see the property. And this is what you can do here in the world of Doc Holiday. Yeah. People can flip through, they can get that sense of it. And then I think if you are, a good novelist and a good historian. And I speak with this about this with many nonfiction authors many times. And they say, you have to go there. You have to walk the ground and you look at the book first. And maybe this is 
a reader's moment where they have that inspiration where they, this is their driving past that house moment. And they say, there's something here that speaks to me and they want the real history of it and not just the films. Because to me, he tells his story, he lives his life, he tells his own story by living his life. Then we get one actor after another portraying him. We get Cesar Romero who portrays him in 1939's Frontier Marshal. I have a few yeah. others here. Kirk Douglas in 1957's Gunfight at the OK Corral, Jason Robards in 1967's Hour of the Gun, Gun. a gentleman named Sam Gilman, who's not as recognizable in the 1968 Star Trek episode, Spectre of the Gun. And the thing about those actors, other than the last gentleman there, Sam Gilman, and then you add Val Kilmer on top of them, is these are all guys that are recognizable, that are real big time heavy hitter actors. So no kidding, you begin to picture them instead of the real Doc Holliday exactly. that we meet here in the world of Doc Holliday. Which of those would you say, setting aside Val <laughs> Kilmer, is the okay. is the best and worst? And, and I only ask about the film because I want to be able to break it down with your books to the real history. So that's why I focus on debunking okay. some of those. We can enjoy the films, but that's not the real history you're bringing us. Yeah, I, I find all those films very fascinating, again, because I know where they come from. I know where the background is. So it's fun for me to watch them. Um, Cesar Romero in Frontier Marshall is just such a fun one to think about because his Doc Holliday, number one, Cesar Romero, is nothing like you'd picture Doc Holliday anyway. Um, and the character that they wrote for him, he's not even a dentist from Georgia. That character is a medical doctor from Boston. And the reason he's West isn't because of his health, it's because he killed somebody in his medical practice back in Boston. So it has nothing to do with Doc Holliday. And then the film has him die in Tombstone, the Cowboys kill him. And then that's what sparks the OK Corral gunfight. Well, in reality, Doc was probably one of the sparks of the fight. He was there, he survived it. He went on and died in Colorado. So that film has absolutely nothing to do with Doc Holliday except the name. And so that name becomes iconic in America. I think it's funny, the film, um, the Michael J. Fox film, Doc Hollywood. Why does that name sound so good to us? It's from Doc Holliday. And he just had a great name. And so he becomes, he becomes the, um, the iconic troubled character in Western films. And it's, it's funny, any film that has a good Doc Holliday, it's a good film. And if it doesn't have a good doc, uh, it doesn't turn out so well. So Kirk Douglas, I loved Kirk Douglas because he was the first time they played Doc Holliday in the films as a troubled Southerner. And that was Doc. So he got that right. And that film, it looks, it doesn't look right to us because it, it looks very 1950s um, TV cowboy Western. You know, their clothing isn't right. The movie Tombstone is great. The clothing is so accurate. So it really takes you there. And um, Gunfight at the OK Corral doesn't visually, but they, he played a really closer to the real doc than any of the others. So I liked him a lot. And actually one of my very favorite docs was in the Star Trek episode was DeForest Kelly in that episode because DeForest Kelly was from Georgia and he had the authentic Georgia accent. And I was a huge DeForest Kelly fan. All my friends had pictures of um, William Shatner in their rooms. I had DeForest Kelly. So yeah, um, I guess I was meant to come to Georgia and fall for this kind of character. I have a framed picture of him upstairs. So Did you? I, I do. Oh my gosh, I had him glued to <laughs> Some my Some illustrated closet. work, yeah. I loved DeForest <laughs> Kelly. And of course he sure. was in one of, the, tomb, one of the, the films about the OK Corral when he was younger. So yep. you're right, everybody, so many different actors have taken on that role. The Doc Holliday character is always the most interesting character in any of those movies. And if you took him out, it's kind of boring. And the problem with it is that Wyatt Earp was kind of a boring guy. <laughs> I hate to say this for all the Wyatt Earp fans out there, but Wyatt was very unemotional. In fact, my friend, author Mark Warren, who's written three wonderful books about Wyatt, he says, I think I've discovered what it is about Wyatt. He, he had no fear. It was not that he was fearless, he just didn't fear. And he also didn't feel a whole lot. So he wasn't a real emotional guy. Well, then, then compare that to Doc, who's nothing but a pile of emotion and reaction. And that's a really good character for a movie. Yes, it was great. I could listen to you all day and I, I uh, probably will. We talked yesterday, everybody should yes. know. And that was when we came up with that Cesar Romero line where you were telling me all the, I love historians because I'm like that too. You know, you this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong. And then the most basic thing we ever look, well, and it was Cesar Romero, which is the most <laughs> un-Doc Holiday guy you could ever imagine. Exactly. And 
The other thing is I'm going to flash up a picture for folks watching on YouTube. There's a picture, you know, I'm sure as a DeForest Kelly fan, it's a promo shot from Spectre of the Gun, that Star Trek episode. And he's holding the gun upside down and looking at it quizzically because <laughs> here he's supposed to be this future guy and he doesn't, doesn't even know, know what. what yeah. And meanwhile, he was this big actor in so many of these Westerns. So uh, and uh, that he is really funny is a he great was in guy. One of them. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's where he had made his bones, so to speak. Exactly. Wow, wasn't that great? That was pretty good, right? That was good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> As I said, so excited to have this conversation. So I'll dial it back a little bit, my enthusiasm, okay. and reintroduce our guest today. You're enjoying my conversation with Victoria Wilcox about her book. It's called The World of Doc Holiday: History and Historic Images. You can visit her at victoriawilcoxbooks.com for more, or you can find our guest on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where you can find me as well. Roy B. Young, who's the editor of the Wild West History Association Journal, writes of the book, Victoria Wilcox has come through on Doc Holliday again, <laughs> this time with a nonfiction book that complements her trilogy of historical fiction books, the saga of Doc Holliday, for which she won numerous awards. This beautiful volume on Doc Holliday's world is a great addition to the literature on his life. Victoria, it's also a beautiful, great addition to my shelf behind me. It will not, <laughs> it will not be going anywhere. It's going to stay right there behind me. So watch Thank future you. interviews for that. Okay. But I wanted to use Roy B. Young's praise because it brings us to how you use both fiction and nonfiction to paint this fuller picture of Doc Holliday's life. How does this illustrated history flesh out Doc's life? And how do you go about narrowing it down to really a beautifully illustrated book? It's not like a novel where you have a, a bunch of words, you still have to edit mm -hmm. it, but how do you do that so that you're giving people a flavor and the right flavor? So they're, they're not just thinking of that backdrop at the OK Corral in some film, but they really experience the world of Doc Holliday as you know it. How did I do that? Um, you know, it was kind of an, uh, the backwards process of writing the novels. In a, in a novel, you try to expand as much as you can. You know a little bit of what happened here or there, and you have to look all around you and figure out what else is going on, how do people feel about it, who else might have been there, to give a real full picture. And when you write a nonfiction like this, what I wanted to do was keep really closely to the history. Part of the reason I wrote it is because I had I had accumulated all of these images to help me write my novels. When I was writing those novels, I was looking at those pictures. So I saw his world and I wanted other people to see that. But I also had come to understand that a lot of Doc Holliday fans are not novel readers. They, they love the movie. They want um, an easy version of his story. They just want the facts, but they want pictures with it. You know, they, they read magazines, they, they read blog posts. And so I aimed it at those readers. So my novels were aimed at novel readers, people who read Gone with the Wind and want to read sort of the sequel that, that incorporates, you know, his relationships to those folks. Um, and this book was aimed toward movie fans and just Doc Holiday fans who would never pick up a novel, but they also are not going to pick up a great big fat biography that's all text either. They want to look at pictures. So I thought of them the whole time I was writing and I tried to have a conversation with them as I was writing. And so I tried very much to keep the narrative of each section. And you mentioned how uh, it follows them along on the trains. Every chapter is named with the train that he was taking at that point in his life. And you, and you learn a little bit about the trains too, because that would have been fascinating to him. In his life, the railroad was a really modern, fabulous way to get around. And so it would have been exciting every time he took a train ride somewhere. So I tried to, um, Imagine my readers with every chapter and just tell them a short version of, of a short narrative version of his history and yet make it extremely accurate. The book is footnoted, but I, I consider it lightly footnoted. I didn't want people to feel like they were reading a textbook. I wanted him just to get the facts of his life. And then so every short narrative section in each chapter is followed by all these little anecdotes, little short stories of different things that happened around him and that related to his life and the pictures. One of my favorite was, I talk about the Linda Ronstadt song, you're no good, baby, you're no good. Linda Ronstadt's ancestor owned the, the um, pleasure park in Tucson where Doc was gambling right before the OK Corral. And so Linda Ronstadt's story connects with Doc Holliday. I loved it. My husband at one point said, you need to title this Railroad Connections 
because so many interesting things out there connect with him. I talk in that same section about where Sprint came from, Southern Pacific Railroad Integrated Technology. That was designed for the Southern Pacific Railroad. The Southern Pacific Railroad was the train that brought the silver down out of the mines of Tombstone and sent it around the country and that took Doc Holliday everywhere. So here we've got a modern thing that we hear on the TV now for an ad and it connects to Doc Holliday's life. So that's all those little stories that run all the way through. And I think they're just fun to read. It's the kind of book that I would have enjoyed reading. It's light, it's fast. You can put it down and pick it up the next day and have some more fun in his world. Definitely add something to your coffee table too. I think if there are people out there who you want to gauge somebody in a job interview, or you just want something on your coffee table that will make people who come over interested. I bet this is one of those books. People are going to pick it up and say, Oh, doc holiday, because we think we know him and it's interesting and it's romantic. And you hear the clip clop of horses. As soon as you hear his name, you see his right. face here on the cover of the world of doc holiday. And I love something else that you wrote in here about his passion. And you say he overreacted to everything in his life, <laughs> which you hinted at there with Wyatt Earp, that he was kind of a, a drip. I mean, Earp, think about oh, wow. the name. He doesn't sound that exciting comparatively to this guy who's, you know, he's always just that passion and the jumping. And the, as far as a narrative thing, I, I don't want to go to the, uh, I don't want to judge by the movies again, that <laughs> sort of thing. But I wanted to ask you something along those yeah. lines. Was there something you reacted passionately to, if not overreacted to, a picture that you wish you could have put here or one you found that you did put in the world of Doc Holliday that you just said, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. I'm so excited <laughs> I can include that in the book here for readers. You know, I'll tell you, there is one picture that I absolutely love and it's a picture that showed up around 1900 and it says it's Doc Holliday in Dallas in 1873. It says it in pencil on the back, John H. Holliday, 1873 Dallas. And I stared at that picture for so many years writing the, the novels because I just, I, I felt like I could see into his soul in that picture. And now we can't prove that it's him. So a lot of historians will say, well, it's not him. We don't have the perfect provenance to prove that it is. But we also have absolutely no provenance saying that's the trail of ownership. We also have, don't have any ownership saying it's not him. And to me, that picture kind of speaks to me. So I look into his eyes there and I feel like, I feel like I know him and I did have an emotional response to that. I, as a writer of history, and I think other writers of history feel this all the time, you feel that the people you write about, they're dead, but they're not far gone. And they want you to know their stories and they kind of lead you along to find things if you're willing to find things. And so I, I often felt his interest in what I was doing and his desire to have me get it right. And I, I, I know that's not unique to me. I um, am a member of a lot of organizations with other writers of history and historical fiction, and it's incredibly common actually. So um, there you go, there's my emotional response to that picture. There are a lot of images that I was not at liberty to put into this book because private collectors have bought images and they keep them for their own I guess just their own souvenirs and they won't let them be published. So there's, um, he actually, I, I believe he actually had a lot of pictures taken of him. As you mentioned, he, he was living during the beginnings of the world of photography and, and taking, having your picture made was a big deal on these trains that he rode on. They'd have whole cars that were designed to be the photographer studios. And these traveling photography studios would go all, all over the West and everybody, you know, everybody in town would go and get their pictures made. So I think we'll continue to find more images of him and get to know him better. The cover was a funny picture. I've had people push back about the cover, people who think they know the history. And they say, well, that's not Doc. Actually, it's, it's, um, it's from a drawing, based on a drawing, based on a photograph, based on an altered photograph, based on a real photograph of Doc Holliday. So yeah, a real picture of him. And you mentioned a coffee table book. It's funny, uh, the art director for the, for the book put a, a, a stain on the cover of the book. So it looks like a stain and Roy Young, when he got his copy, I guess he looked for some other copies to see if he could find one that didn't have a stain. They're all stained. And I don't think it's a coffee stain. I think it's a whiskey bottle stain. Of course, it's Doc Holliday. Yeah. I just love listening to you talk about Doc Holliday <laughs> because I love to bring somebody to life. And I love to share with viewers and listeners of the History Author Show, people that we do think we know that we've got those images and we can just say, I wonder what he was really like, because the reason that they've lasted this long and people make movies is because they are fascinating. They lived a real life and they were real mm -hmm. people. 
And the reason that we didn't talk too much yet, I didn't bring up the OK Corral, is that for me, I, I push those things to the end of the interview because sometimes 30 seconds can define your life. If you're somebody that's killed tragically, sometimes all people want to talk about. We mentioned yesterday, Abraham Lincoln. You can't not see him there in the box Ford's at Ford's Theater, Theater being yep. shot. And so the same with Doc. I mean, those were 30 seconds of the guy's life. And people just assume that he was this stone cold killer that was wandering from town to town, spoiling for a fight and go for your gun, kid, and all this kind of stuff. And see, I even ruined his accent there. That's what he sounds like <laughs> to me, which I know is wrong. But hey, I'm not Val Kilmer, right? <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about that. That part of his character is so key. We picture him as born with a gun in his hand, to quote the old lyrics, right? That he he just always was a guy who, who was going to shoot first, ask questions later, which when you think about it, for me, even though doctors weren't very licensed back then, and, and this we picture as a violent time, why would you want to be a doctor, much less a dentist, if you just wanted to shoot people all day? So then, yeah, as I read the world of Doc Holliday, I realized maybe that's why that's that always kind of stuck in the back of my mind. So let me ask you about that. In the case of Doc Holliday, his life is distilled down, not just to that bullet, but also to his death, those 18 months he spends in Tombstone battling tuberculosis before he passes away. What do you hope readers will learn about the broader scope of his life from your book that goes beyond the date of my birthday, by the way, October 26th? Is that right? Yes, was not born in 1881, but the same day <laughs> as the shootout at the OK Corral. That's a significant date to me. So there we go. So outside of that and his death and those 30 seconds, what do you hope readers will learn about Doc's life? Well, I have to first comment and say about his death. His death date is November the 8th, and that's my birthday. So we have something uh, in common here. We have some Doc Holiday dates. Wow. I hope that people will come away knowing what he was really like. Number one, the tombstone thing, 18 months of his life. And actually, he wasn't really battling consumption during that time. There's absolutely no reports of his being ill at that time. Um, the dry air of Arizona seemed to help him a lot. He spent a lot of time going from one hot springs resort to another around the West. Number one thing that I hope that they, they can correct is the, the false image that he didn't care if he lived or died. And that was something that, you know, was thrown at me when I very first started writing. That's supposedly, that's why he was so brave in a gun battle because he didn't care if he lived or died. Well, I wanna ask you, 23 years old, when he first is, starts out in the West, do you, do you know many 23 year olds who literally don't care if they live or die? Most people wanna live. Some people want very much to die. I've never met anybody who just was ambivalent about life or death. And so that's bogus. He did not care if he lived or died. Of course he wanted to live. So uh, number two, stone cold killer. He was not a stone cold killer and he didn't have a long string of, of gunfights. He got into gun battles because he put himself in dangerous places. He had a gambling habit in Dallas, Texas. Um, probably his gambling is what ruined his career there with the partner he had in dentistry. Um, he was arrested again and again and again for gambling in a house of spiritus liquors. Um, unlike the movie image that we have of the, these guys sitting around playing poker with their whiskey in their hand, their six shooter under the table, it was against the law in almost every Western town to drink in the same place that you played cards and nobody was allowed to take a gun into the saloon. You had to hang them up with the saloon keeper when you went in because everybody knows if you're gambling and drinking and you got a gun, somebody's gonna die. And so that, that was completely wrong. And, but he, would often go into these saloons and he'd have a drink while playing cards. And that's actually what he got arrested for, like dozens of times, drinking in a saloon while playing cards. He did it so much that he lost his dental practice. He did it so much that he ruined his reputation. And when you do something again and again that's ruining your life, it's a pretty easy bet you're an addict. And he, ex and he evidences many of the personality traits of a gambling addict. So this was his vice, this was his compulsion. And he practiced just like, an, just like a gambler will do. He, he didn't gamble to make money. He gambled to gamble because it feels good, because it's exciting. And he worked as a dentist to make enough money to gamble. So he called, you know, we called himself a sporting man. It's not a proud thing. He was a sporting man because it was the nicest way to say I'm a gambling addict. He was arrested in Denver, Colorado several times for the same thing, for gambling, and actually got run out of town in the end of his life because they said, you're just part of the riffraff. So 
I hope people can come to understand that, that he wasn't dealing just with a disease. He was also dealing with probably alcohol addiction and a gambling habit. So he was challenged. And part of that, though, comes from the fact that he was such an emotional and passionate and dramatic person. He just kind of went overboard in everything. So where somebody else could have had a drink and gone home, no, Doc could get, he gets smashed. Where somebody else could play cards and then go home, no, he's going to gamble away everything he's got. There's a story that he made $10,000 on a turn of a hand, never happened. I hope people can understand that. And because of the movies, people like to hold him up as the picture of who and what they should be. I've had so many Doc Holiday fans tell me they want to be just like him because they think he's smart and they think he's sassy and they think he doesn't care. And that's not true. He cared very much. And he would not want people following in his footsteps, doing the things he did wrong. I am certain that his 18 months in Tombstone, he wished he could just forget. There were terrible things that happened in that this, this didn't care if he killed people story. That's not him. His mistress, Kate Elder, said that when he came back to their rooms after the gun battle, you know, in the movie Tombstone, you watch, you watch him and Wyatt, they just walk away together after it's over. That didn't happen. Wyatt went home with his injured brother. Stock went back to his rooms and he sat down on the bed and he cried. And Kate asked him, you know, what do you want me to do? Um, he said, go away, leave me alone. And he said, this is awful, awful, because what happened was awful. And it carried him through the rest of his life. And then, you know, another big gun battle that he's famous for is the shooting in the Tucson train yard, where he and Wyatt finally took care of Frank Stillwell, the guy who had murdered Wyatt's brother, Morgan. And um, the movies portray that being Wyatt bravely killing this bad guy. In reality, Frank Stillwell's body, when they found him the next day, he was just riddled with bullet holes. The guy who found him said he'd never seen a man so shot up. All of Wyatt's posse, which included Doc, fired into this guy. Why? Because it's plausible deniability. It's a firing squad. I don't know who shot him. And for the rest of his life, people would ask Doc about that. And he'd say, I, I know that Frank Stillwell was um, a stagecoach robber and a murderer, but I do not know that I had anything to do with this death. Plausible deniability. So he carried those things with him the rest of his life. This wasn't nothing to him. He didn't just shoot people down. So I think he would like that to be known about him too, that he regretted the things that he did. He said himself, I digressed from the paths of rectitude, which means that he knew what the paths of rectitude, which means to do things right. He knew what was wrong. And he knew when he slid off of that path and he certainly wouldn't want other people following in his path. So I hope the true story of his life is more a prescription to how not to live, but how to keep trying to live, how to keep making it against tremendous odds. He did deal with this horrible disease for most of his life. And, you know, the traveling that he did and the uh, having to take care of himself on his own while also dealing with a very uh, a hopeless disease, that's tough. Um, and in his last days, Wyatt Earp was not with him before he died, but he had a lot of other people who were. And a lot of the people in Glenwood Springs put together money to help take care of his funeral expenses because they thought highly of him. And they admired him for persevering in the face of difficulties. And you don't understand why he was that kind of passionate, troubled person, unless you understand his early life. And I hope I portrayed that in both books, giving people the truth about, you know, growing up during reconstruction and civil war, that's rough. You're a child of war, you're gonna have some lingering problems. So there you go. I, I want people to know the real him because I think he would like his own truth to be known. Unless you understand his world, you said his life. <laughs> Unless you understand his world, as well as his life, you won't really know who he was. It's so important. We take it for granted because it's like fish swimming. Do they know they're wet? But this world of his was very different. It was a world changing. You oh, mentioned yeah. the trains a few times. You have that great chapter 10, I believe it is. Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. You get the song in your head. And there's so many things that stick with us from the Old West. So, and... His, his cousin there, that's something that is another lingering myth about him and his world. And when you pick up the world of Doc Holliday, you see how their life was. And you see that the things that we just judge and just assume about this area and this period of time, it's so different. It's so much richer than that. And so I wanted to close by wrapping up with a final question about that. Why should readers pick up this book? You, you have that passion for Doc Holliday. 
So give us Doc's fever. I don't want you to infect us with tuberculosis, of course, but <laughs> give us give us a little bit, a little bit, a low grade fever of Doc Holiday fever. Tell us why we should pick up the world of Doc Holiday, get hooked on Doc Holiday, and then hopefully maybe consider picking up your novels. I'll tell people to pick up your your Doc Holiday oh, trilogy, you. so you don't have to because you're you're <laughs> modest. But get in this world, get as passionate as I am today about this book. Why should readers pick up? The world of Doc Holliday as that gateway? I think because his life is um, such a description of America in the 19th century, because he was born in the Old South right before the start of the Civil War. He lived through the Civil War. He lived through Reconstruction. He was a rebellious kid during the Yankee occupation of his, of his state. He went north and had to experience what life in, you know, in a whole different culture was like, how was, what was his value living in a, in a, in a world that didn't value the things that he did. And then he, he pushes West with the rest of the country going West. If you follow Doc through his world, you're going to be following America as it develops and seeing it through the eyes of one very intriguing character. You can just read about these things in general, or you can go with him and experience the second half of the 19th century and watch America go from the old South to the very end of the Wild West. You know, Tombstone had telephones. Glenwood Springs, where he died, had electric lights. He's, the Old West is done by the time Doc's done. And his, his fascinating personality will take you all the way through that history in a way you've never seen it before. And it'll become personal to you. It did for me. I, I can't experience those things without seeing them through his eyes now. Well, Victoria Wilcox, I, I'm a little bit sad that this interview is over, but I'm glad that I still have your books to go back to because this was a lot of fun. I hope it was fun for everybody watching and listening as we discussed the world of Doc Holliday and also got a little bit in about your novels, which hopefully will pique people's interest. Regular listeners know that I'm a big fan of historical fiction, so I'm so happy to have those books on my shelf from your Doc Holliday trilogy. There, look, that's another little card there for people watching, and <laughs> we have all of them here. The Saga of Doc Holliday. What a great name, and it's a lot of fun. You get to know him, get to know the real relationship that he had with his cousin, which was not scandalous, as I guess that he says in the movie there does Val Kilmer's Doc Holliday. Get to know the real guy. Get to know him beyond the wire that's in the OK Corral, penning him in. He had a short life, but boy, did he fill it up. His world is so fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Victoria Wilcox, for sharing it with all of us today. I wish you the best of luck with all your books. Thank you so much, Dean. It's been so fun. Again, the book is The World of Doc Holliday, History and Historic Images. As always, you could find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode by buying this book, any book, or even one of Victoria Wilcox's novels in the Doc Holiday series, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. And let me tell you, it means a lot to authors to give their time, come on the show, and then sometimes they'll send me a little graph of their Amazon numbers after the show has aired, and it just shoots straight up. That's gratifying for me as well, and I really thank you for supporting the show and our authors. My sincere thanks to Victoria Wilcox for joining all of us today and for introducing us to the real man behind an Old West legend. Visit her at victoriawilcoxbooks.com, and you can follow both of us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Plus, remember to check out our YouTube channel, where I hope you'll subscribe to watch future time travel adventures. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until it's time for that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Victoria Wilcox and Doc Holliday, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east, sign west, sign things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.